give the Lord another praise offering this morning with our hands and thank the Lord because it is Senior Sunday and what a, what a special time in those young people's lives as they're stepping out and going into the future and some of you uh, can can remember that. It wasn't that long ago for some of us. Uh, we don't want to admit how long ago high school was, and uh, but it's, it's so exciting for them, and it's also a very special day in the life of, of our church here at, here at Five Stone. We, if you have been with us uh, over these last few weeks, then you're very aware, aware of the Beyond Initiative as we want to further the mission and the vision of our church. We want to focus on on making some campus improvements and some renovations so that uh, we might be able to continue to do the ministry that God has led us to do. And so we've been asking our church family, if you're a guest, what we've been asking our church family to do is to be a part of helping us take that next step to further the mission and the vision of the church. And we've asked that uh, our church family would make a commitment, a financial commitment, over a two-year period that might help us reach a goal. And so today is actually what we just call Big Give Sunday because it officially starts the two-year giving period. Um, from now, May of 2024 until May of 2026, we are going to enter into uh, this opportunity to be able to contribute uh, toward the renovations and the future of our church. If you're new, you could see some of those that are uh, provided out in the lobby through the architectural renderings and what God has laid on our hearts to do to transform our building, but also to upgrade te technology and to make sure that we're ready for the future to continue to provide for online ministry in a greater way so that people, when they visit our church online, that's really the front door of our church. As people have told me over the last couple of years, most, if not all people that I have talked to, and when I've asked them, how did they come to find out Five Stone, they said, well, we've been watching you online. We watch services online, and then we decided to come in person. And so we want to upgrade that. We want to give uh, the people who are watching online a much better experience. We want to create welcoming spaces uh, that will allow people to make Five Stone a destination through, uh, throughout the week and ultimately to grow our kids' ministry through an indoor playground, potentially uh, Mother's Day programs and, and other kind of things uh, that God might lead us to do, as well as focus on discipleship and that next generation. We have such a great kids ministry and student ministry. We want to continue to provide the in environments that they need so that they might grow in their faith in the Lord as well. And so, uh, as you know, a few weeks ago, we had a, a commitment Sunday in which we brought out uh, this brand new a replica of a chest of Joash. In the Old Testament, uh, King Joash, when God's building, God's temple needed repair, uh, he called the people to give an offering. And so he made a chest, bored a hole in the top so that the people could bring their contribution and their offering and place it in that chest. And so uh, we had this chest built so that we could be reminded that we're trying to improve our facilities and upgrade and think about the future and taking care of God's house. So when we made that uh, commitment on Commitment Sunday, uh, I told you we we're gonna give some updates today. And so I wanna do that, that uh, we've got some incredibly great news that over 107%, now some of you are saying, Jerry, that's kind of your weird math. I'm saying, well, well, no, that's Chad Howard's number. That's not my, my number, okay? So, but really, how do you get to 107%? Well, that, that means out of our consistent core giving households or individuals, they, that means that those people plus brand new people who had never really been a, a giver at Five Stone, who had never jumped into uh, supporting the mission and the vision, uh, that means that, that 
over 107% made some kind of commitment to the Beyond Initiative. And this is by, by far an overwhelming response. This is a super, super positive response. What this means is, is that our church family understands that this isn't just uh, superficial improvements, that it isn't just some new paint, some new carpet, and some new bells and whistles and toys. You know, I really believe that our church understands that this is going to help us further the mission and the vision of the church, that we need to take these steps, that we need to do uh, this improvement so that our campus can be better suited for the future and reach more people for Jesus. And so we're, we're super, super excited by the response that we have received and what has happened from the people who are committed. Now, some of you may be wondering about a, a number, like we had a goal, we had a preferred goal of $2.2 million. And so on Sunday, June 2nd, we're going to have a special announcement regarding how much money has been given toward our $2.2 million goal. Now, here's what I want to, want to say to you. Some of you are going like, why didn't you tell us today? Why don't you tell us where we are today? Well, we know this, that we're still receiving some commitments, that some people have yet to make a commitment, and so we're gonna give them another opportunity. Plus, next Sunday is a holiday weekend, so we wouldn't wanna make a big announcement like that on a holiday weekend. So just mark your calendars, hold on, it's coming June 2nd. You don't wanna miss it because we're gonna have this special announcement about the total of the amount of the commitments. And we're prayerful that not only are gonna talk about the money goal, but we're gonna be able to share with you some numbers that, have, uh, that hopefully will get to us from the contractor. We're still waiting uh, for some specific numbers on the work and all the stuff that's gonna happen. And all that will be laid out on June 2nd for you. So. Here's what I would want to encourage us today as we think about starting a commitment, as we think about making a commitment, if you haven't made one yet. I want to make sure that you understand, and this is my conviction. This is something that Jennifer, my wife and I, we have lived uh, ever since I got saved when I was 19 years old. Someone just taught me biblical stewardship. Someone taught me that you ought to honor the Lord. You ought to put him first. You ought to give to the Lord first. And God is going to take care of you. God will supply. And this is what the bottom line is when we consider all of this, is that God will provide. God will take care of his people. God will take care of this church when we honor him and when we glorify him and when we put him first, God will provide. I stand on that conviction. I have, I have seen it play out in my life personally, in the life of our family, in the life of my kids. God has been the provision for all that we have needed. He has been so good and so generous to us and, and he has been the provider and so today, as we start this, I just want to remind you that, that how this is true. This is true because you see it in the Word of God. So today's message is a little different in that I usually take one passage and we just unpack it or we're walking through a biblical book or something like that. But today, I want to kind of take you just on a journey through the Word of God. We're going to start in Genesis Understanding how does God provide for us? What does God do? Can we really trust that he will be the provider of all that we need in our life? There are three specific statements that I'm just gonna give for you and then show you out of scripture how God fulfills those things. Here's the first one. God will provide because that is who he is. In other words, he has revealed himself to us in the word of God so that we might know him, so that we might understand him, so that we could know what kind of God he really is. 
Throughout the scripture, he has given himself names. He has proven himself uh, to be God, the God who fights our battles, the God who goes before us, the God who is the banner over us. And all of these are associated with the name Yahweh or Jehovah. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He is Jehovah Tekiznu. He, he is all of these names and these things because he wants us to know this is who I am. You can trust me in this. I'm going to be the Lord of armies. I'm going to be the one who fights your battles. I'm going to be the one who goes before you. I'm going to be your covering. I'm going to be your peace. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am all of these things to you. And so in the very beginning of the Bible, when you look in the book of Genesis, God takes this man out of Ur of the Chaldees. He takes this man named Abram, and he says, Abram, I want you to be obedient, and I want you to go to a new place. I want you to uproot, leave everything that you're familiar with, and I want you to go. He didn't say, he didn't tell him where he was going to go. He just said, Abram, will you go? At the time, he was Abram. So he said, Abram, get up and follow me. Abram did that. And as Abram was faithful to follow God and to be obedient in that calling to go, God began to reveal things to Abram and he began to show him things. And one of the things that he said to Abram, he said, he said I am going to make you the father of a great nation. You are gonna be the father of this great nation and all the nations on the earth are gonna be blessed through you. You're gonna look one day at all of your descendants and it's gonna be as if you are looking up in the night sky, not the Dallas sky, but the deep West Texas sky where you can actually see the stars. Abram was able to look up and he saw this, this incredible field of stars that could not be counted and he says, Abram, that is what your descendants are gonna be like. They're gonna be like the stars of the sky that you are not even able to count. It's gonna be like the, the sand on the seashore. You're gonna, you're gonna have so many offspring. Well, as, as Abram began to walk in that, he became Abraham and, and things didn't go exactly the way he thought they would. He, he said, how can I be the father of this great nation when I'm not even having any children? I don't have a child. And, and so even in his obedience and willingness to go and do what God wanted him to do, there was a time in his life when he got out of the will of God and tried to take things into his own hands. And we're still reaping repercussions of that today. And so God does fulfill the promise to Abraham, and he gives him a son. And the Bible calls him his, his only son, his, his beloved son, the, the one and only. And as Isaac, this, this promised one who is a type of Christ, was growing up, Isaac was, was of a young age and probably around 12 or so, strapping and strong. And Abraham's an old man at this time. And God said to Abraham, you take your son, your one and only son, and you go sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. And so Abraham told Isaac, it's time for us to go and to sacrifice they got the wood and they had the knife. And as they were traveling up that mountain, Isaac said, Father, look, here is the wood and here's the knife. But where is the lamb? Where is the ram to sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide. In the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. And Isaac submitted himself there on that altar, Isaac was going to become the sacrifice. And, and as Abraham got ready to lift up and, and to sacrifice his son, God stopped him and said, Abraham, you have shown yourself to be faithful and obedient. 
You do not have to sacrifice your son. And as Abraham looked up, he saw a ram caught by the horns in a thicket. Do you get the imagery? There was a lamb, a ram by the horns, crowned with thorns as Jesus was when he went to the cross. That that lamb, that ram that was caught by the horns and crowned and, and caught up became a substitute just like Jesus became our substitute. And in that time, Abraham realized that that God provides because that is who he is. And so in Genesis 22, 14, Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. When, when Abraham says the Lord will provide, he's, he's saying the Lord is Yahweh Jireh. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. You see, when we walk in obedience and when we do what God calls us to do, he provides for us. And that's exactly what we see as you go through the scripture and you come into the New Testament and the teaching of our Lord Jesus. When he was teaching the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what? All these things will be provided for you. You see, Jesus was proclaiming a message that Jehovah, Father, God, Yahweh can be trusted as a God who will provide all that you need. Jesus comes along and he says, why do you worry about what you're going to eat? Why do you worry about what you're going to wear? Don't be anxious for those things. For your heavenly father, your Jehovah Jireh knows that you need all of these things. Our command is to seek first the kingdom and the righteousness of God. And all this other stuff is going to be added to us. God will take care of us just like he took care of Abraham. God will provide when we put him first. You know, when you think about what the message of Jesus was, you listen, don't, listen don't, don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Just trust God in those things. And Jesus was saying, I, my father is going to provide for you. My father is going to give you all that you need. And Jesus began to, to give some earthly examples. We, we need those. We need that teaching. We need those examples. And so Jesus comes along and he says in Matthew 6, 26, he says, look at the birds of the sky. Consider the birds. Just think about those for a moment. <laughs> I, I was, when I thought about this passage, it, it just brought back some, some crazy memories. Uh, I, this is kind of pastoral transparency, just so you know a little bit more about Jerry. I don't like birds, okay? They, they kind of wig me out. Anybody else kind of wigged out by birds? Okay, you're a bunch of bird lovers. I, and I can't even tell the story now. Come on, somebody, all right, anyway, I'm gonna tell it anyway, right? And I don't know why, but, but I just really, I don't like birds that much. I, I guess they kind of look dinosaurish to me, you know, still kind of predator, like, you know, kind of that kind of stuff. When I was a little kid, I was about three or four years old, and, and we lived on this street, and and. And I, we kind of lived down the hill, up one side, and then it, the, house, the street turned and went up the hill another way. And, and one street was Somerset, one was Briarwood. And our house faced Briarwood, but up Somerset, there was a family at the, up the hill, and they, they were an older couple, and my parents knew them well. And so little three, four-year-old Jerry would just kind of wander up the hill up to uh, the neighbor's house where their, their last name was Rollers and uh, Roller. And, and so I'd go up to Mr. and Mrs. Roller's house and I'd be sitting down and talking to Mr. Roller and, and I would say, you know, I, ha I, have a, I have a bird. And Mr. Roller knew I didn't have a bird. But I, I was telling him, I have a bird. 
And, and Mr. Rose said, oh, you have a bird? I said, yeah, I have a bird. Well, I want to come see your bird. No, you can't see my bird. Well, why can't I see your bird? It's in the closet. It lives in the closet. Well, Mr. Roller came down and talked to my parents and said, hey, did you know Jerry's telling me that he has a bird? And, and, and you know, I know he doesn't have a bird. Well, rather than my parents teaching me not to lie, they went out and bought me a bird. Um, I, I, I've never figured that out. I don't understand that model of parenting. I mean, I don't advocate that, especially in the family service. I told that story. I said, listen, kids, don't try to lie and get something you want. I mean, that doesn't always work. That's not the, the point. But, but all of a sudden, I end up with this parakeet, right? This little bird. I, I didn't, don't even really like birds. Last Tuesday was Stephen Savage's birthday. So the pastor staff, we, we went out to celebrate his birthday. And we were going to eat in downtown Plano. So we went out to eat lunch together and had a great time and, and just goofing off. And, and after lunch, we were leaving and walking and, and through downtown Plano. I don't know if y'all have ever been down there to eat or, or any of those things. But, you know, they got these trees everywhere and you look down on the ground and you know what? I mean, it's just the birds have, have done nature and, and, and so we're walking through and I had parked about a block or so away and you know, big buildings over here, big buildings over here and these, these trees and I'm just walking through and I'm just imagining like I am about to get it. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking like, why don't they shield this place? You know, why don't they put some kind of covering? And so I get to this area and I'm, I'm just even with the tree and I'm, I'm just right to the edge of it. And all of a sudden, I feel this wham, bam. It just comes and hits my head. I mean, a bird left the tree and came down and just smacked and attacked me. I didn't know what, honestly, I didn't know what happened. I thought, I thought, did I just run into a limb? I mean, I'm very short. I couldn't have run into a limb. Uh, and and <laughs> Chad Howard, Stephen Savage, Kobe, they all just started, ah! You just got dived on by a bird. A bird just came and hit you. And I'm going, yeah, I don't even like birds. No wonder. I'm, and when I told that story in the first service, one of our older senior adults was sitting there. Oh, sweet Tommy Stevens. He said, well, obviously those birds don't like you either. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus is teaching us about birds. I don't know why he uses the birds, but anyway, okay. They don't sow or reap, do they? They don't gather in barns, but what? Jehovah Jireh, God takes care of them. But look at the question Jesus poses. Aren't you worth more than they? If God would take care of the birds, and I, I love what one translation says, look, you're much more important than birds. Jesus goes on and he says, look at the wildflowers. Look at the flowers of the field. Look, look how they grow. They don't spin. They, they, don't, they don't toil. He said, but God takes care of them. And he says, aren't you much more cared for than the flowers? You see, God takes care of his creation. It is in his nature. It is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God who provides. He provides for creation. Who and what is the crowning jewel of God's creation? It is you. It is me. It is man and woman made in his image. Imago Dei. We bear the image of Jehovah Jireh. We are bearers of God's image. And if he takes care of the birds, and if he takes care of the flowers, aren't you of more value than them? Why would he not care for you? Why would he not take care of you? He does because that's his nature. God cannot violate his nature. He is Jehovah Jireh. He's going to provide everything you need. God says... I'll take care of you because it's who I am. It's my nature. But here's the second truth. God's gonna provide 
because he's proven it in what he has already done for us. Now you think about what has God done for you? I, I want to ask you a question. What's your greatest need today? You think about that, well, well, do you need, yeah, we want security, right? We want, we need happiness, we need, we need love, we need provision, we, we need clothes to wear, we, we need a place to live, we, we need food. I'm, I could go on and on and on, but, but honestly, think about what is your greatest need? You see, the truth if you stop and get down to it, your greatest need is not to be happy. Your greatest need is, is not even to, to have clothes and, and food and, and those kind of things. Folks, I wanna remind us today that God did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. God gave his own son. Your greatest need was a savior, was a redeemer, someone to rescue me and you from the sin nature that we were born with. We were born alienated, separated from this great God, but God so loved us, God so loved the world that he gave, amen? He gave his one and only begotten son. And you gotta love the logic of the apostle Paul. He says, how will he not also with him grant us, I want you to say this next word out loud with me, grant us what? Everything. Do you understand that Jehovah Jireh has proven himself that he will provide for you? Not just physically, not just emotionally, not just spiritually, but in everything. God wants to be the great provider because he's proven it by giving us the greatest thing that we ever needed, his own son for our salvation. Folks, listen to me. You and I could not meet our greatest need on our own. We have no way of obtaining a righteous life, living a perfect sinless life before a holy God. We are sinners. And that one sin separates us from God. But God says, listen, I'm taking care of your greatest need. And that proves that he is gonna take care of all of your needs. If God did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things. He's proven it by his character. It's who he is. He's proven it by what he's done. But this third one is something that, that we often forget. That God will provide because it is what he, listen to this, he desires us to do. Think about it. What is God's goal in your life? Why were you created? You were created to glorify God, to honor God with your life. Why do you have life today? God gave you life, not so you could just live whatever life you want to live in any way that you want to live it. No, God gave you life so that you might honor and glorify God with the life that he has given to you. Everything that you've been given is to be given back to God because God is a giver. We are to become like him. We're to be like God. If God is a giver, we should be givers. If God is generous, we should be generous. If God sacrifices, we should sacrifice. It's what God desires we do. So God has given to us. Why? He gave to us first so that we can give in return. Everything that we have comes from him. Now you think about this. I, I love what Paul says in, this is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. This is the New American Standard Version. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. 
Now, I know that's a lot of words on the screen, but here's what I want you to understand. Now, God supplies seed. God provides. Seed to what or whom? A sower. God supplies your life, not so you can live your life. God supplies your life so that you might spread your life. You might sow your life. God's given you everything so that you might give it back. So so the Bible teaches that if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow abundantly, then you're going to reap abundantly. You give because God first gave to us. He supplies seed to the sower. If you go back and, 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 and understand that, God's saying, I'm giving to you so that you can reject this idea of greed and rather embrace generosity. Jesus says, be on your guard against every form of greed. You see, it's in our nature to... To, to hold on. It's, it's not in our nature to give. We, you know, we're kind of, I'm great what ifers. Any of y'all are overpackers on a trip? I am the world's worst overpacker, especially if we're going on a two week mission, you know, somewhere else, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, what if? I mean, you know, what if I spit up on myself? How often do you spit up on yourself, Jerry? I don't know, but what if I did? What if, what if, what if this happens? What if that happens? And, and you know, you just, what, what? what? And, and it's kind of like we can do that with, with our life. Well, what, what if the economy turns around? What if I don't have a job? What if, and, and we, what if, what if? And, and we begin to, to hold on to stuff that God says, hold loosely, be willing to give, be generous. Do you see what, what the verse says? The one who supplies seed to the sower But what? Will supply, multiply your seed for sowing, increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, I just want you to look at some words. I want you to, God will say this word out loud, supply. God will, say it again, supply. God will what? Multiply. Our seed for sowing. Do you get that? And he's going to increase. God is going to increase the harvest of your righteousness. God gave you a supply that he wants to multiply. But listen, you got to give it away before he's going to multiply it. You got to be willing to let go before he grows it. You got to be willing to sow it in the ground and plant it and let it let it bear fruit. If you hold on to it and don't plant and don't sow, you are not going to reap. Jesus said this in Luke 6:38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be poured into your lap. For with the measure, now look at this verse. Look, with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. So little, reap little. So much, reap much. Now folks, let me make sure you understand. This verse is not teaching a prosperity gospel. This verse is not saying that, man, if you give, you're gonna get. If, if you just give, God is gonna give to you. That is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus do, doesn't teach us, okay, you give so that you can get. No, 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 no. It's not give to get. Jesus is saying, hey, I've already given. You you have it already. The question is, what are you going to do with what you have? And see, a lot of times we think, okay, well, I can't give it because, because then I won't have it. But you see, if you don't give it, then God can't give again. 
Not so that we hold on to it, not so that we store up bigger barns and, and more for ourselves. No, it's like you give not to get, but you, you've already gotten what God wants you to have. But sow it into what he wants you to sow it into. Are you willing to give it away? You see, folks, I don't know how, I don't know why. I was so blessed when I was 19 years old, I had gone to church almost every Sunday in my life. No one ever said to me, Jerry, you need to be a giver. Jerry, you need to be generous and you need to honor the Lord. The Lord has honored you. The Lord has blessed you. I was 19 years old. I had started working at motorcycle shops when I had just I was 14, just 15, got a hardship license, driving to the motorcycle shop, had no idea I would ever go to college. No one in my family had ever been to a four-year university. We weren't that kind of people. My, my dad's a strong blue-collar worker all of his life. I mean, I had ambition that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race motorcycles, work at the motorcycle shop, and, and Jerry's going to be just fine. By the time I was 19 years old, starting at, at, you know, 15 or so, by the time I was 19, 20 years old, I was managing a, a Honda and Yamaha dealership and also took on a BMW line when I was about 20 years old. When I got saved when I was 19, someone taught me, you honor the Lord and you give. You put him first and God will take care of you. You sow and God will, will reap. He'll, he'll give it back so you can keep sowing. Jennifer and I, when, when we got married, she, she was taught stewardship. She was taught tithing and giving and offerings. And, and so we just operated, used to, when we were writing checks, we, we were writing checks for our, our Big Give Sunday. We actually wrote a check. Usually it comes in from our bank directly. But we we're actually wrote checks. And, and when we were writing that check, it reminded me that that's the way we used to do it. First check principle. When we got paid, we didn't look at the net. We looked at the gross. We, we, we tithed. We gave offerings above. We still do that. We believe tithing is, is a floor. It's not a ceiling. It is, it is something that you do. You honor the Lord, give him the tenth, and then give above the tenth with offerings and to missions and missionaries and organizations that, that we love and support. And listen to me. As we have done that, God has provided for us so in, in so incredible ways. We taught that to our kids. If you get a job, give to the Lord. If we give you an allowance and you, you work around the house for that allowance, give to the Lord. Put the Lord first. Jennifer and I were having a conversation several weeks back with our youngest son, the number three out of, out of my kids. And he and his wife were there. And she grew up in a God-fearing home that taught her about stewardship. And she was taught the same way that, that, that Parker was. That when, when God blessed them, they gave. They tithed or they gave above the tithe. And, and and so they were saying to us, we are so glad that we grew up in homes that taught us that from a young age because there are a lot of their friends now who are now in the workplace and they're making, you know, decent money and they want to give to the Lord, but it just looks like a huge amount. Oh, we can't do that. I mean, we can't give that much. But you see, if you, if you start with making $10 a week doing a job, give the Lord a dollar of it. You still got nine left. And listen, he'll, he'll teach you how to handle the nine better than you could the 10 if you just have the nine. You see, God wants us to be sowing and giving. And he's, he's given to us so that we can give. So that we can bless others. He gives to us so that we can join him in his kingdom work, folks. 
When you give to Five Stone, it's kingdom work. It's sowing into this church and, and providing online experience and, and youth ministry and uh, senior adult ministry. All kinds of ministries are being provided for because you give. It's kingdom work. It's mission work. We give to local missions and to global missions, and, and we support those things. It's kingdom work. God says this. He will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, it's interesting. A lot of us love that verse, and we love to quote that verse. About six or seven verses earlier, we love to quote verse 13 as well. I can do all things through Christ that gives me the strength. And we, we ignore the context. Do you know the context that Paul's talking about? He says, I've, I've learned what it is to be in want, and I've learned what it is to have plenty. And God has taught me that, that he comes first. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. He's talking about this, this idea of, of being supplied. And in this context of this verse, he's talking about people who are giving to his ministry. And when they give, he says this statement, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The context is giving. You see, God gave us first so that we could give. And if you're like Abram and Abraham, if you're willing to give, God will supply. He'll be Jehovah Jireh. But if you want to try to do it on your own, you're going to fall short. You, you can't do it on your own. You need God to supply for you. And you see, I don't know if anyone's ever taught you stewardship. I don't know if you've ever practiced biblical stewardship. I don't know if, you, if you've really practiced generosity and some of you may push back on the tithe and, and you say, I don't believe the the. The word teaches tithing. I think we ought to just give out of the heart. Well, listen, as long as you're giving generously, praise God. Jesus never lowered the standard of the law. He always raised it. He said, don't commit adultery. He said, but hey, don't even look at a woman to lust. He says, don't commit murder. He, oh, well, he raised the standard. Don't even have hate in your heart toward a brother. Jesus never dumbed down the law, and tithing preceded the law. It superseded the law. And Jesus says, don't neglect the tithe, but give from your heart. Matthew 23, 23. You may push back on the tithe, but I would say, that's fine. If you don't believe in the tithe, then give 15%, 20%, 30%. You see, most people push back on the 10%, because unfortunately, we fit into that demographic where Christians nowadays, on average, give 2.3% of their income to the Lord. 2.3%. So I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're generous. I don't know if you've never given. I don't know if you're one of those new people that have just started with the Beyond Initiative. But here's what I do know that God wants you to take a next step. And what step do you need to take to prove that you know Jehovah Jireh? You know who he is, you know what he's done, and you know what he wants you to do. You see, for some of us, we need to trust. You've never given before. And man, it's hard. But you can trust God because he'll provide. For some of you, it may be greater faith. Maybe you need to increase giving. Maybe you're, you're giving a little out of the leftovers. You're paying all the bills and then you look at the bottom line. Well, you still got to buy gas and get groceries. And so what can I give? Maybe you need to put God first and see how he works in your life. 
you have greater faith. And then for some of you, you just need that biblical conviction. That sacrificial giving is this sweet aroma. It is this, it is this acceptable sacrifice. It is pleasing to God. That's Philippians 4.18. Just before, my God will supply all of your needs. That when we give, and when we give sacrificially, it's like this sweet, fragrant offering that is wafting up to the Lord. And he says, this is good. You trust me. You believe me. I'll give you more. Not to increase you, but so that you can give more. So, so, so. Today, we begin our commitment. God will provide. I believe it. Jennifer and I have lived it for 39 years of marriage now. And by God's grace, we're going to keep putting him first in everything that we do. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to follow me and Jennifer and bring a gift today as an offering to the Lord. If you've already given to the Beyond Initiative and and you've already started giving, then I encourage you, grab an envelope and just write on that envelope, have already started giving, but in an act of worship, come and bring your gift before the Lord. If you're a guest, please feel no pressure. This is our Five Stone family taking care of our Five Stone house that the Lord has given to us. I'm going to pray, and then Jennifer and I, if you would, allow us just to lead the way, and we're going to put in our gift, and then if the Lord moves on your heart to come, you come. But I want you to hear something that's very important today. God's not interested in your money. God wants your heart. God wants your life. And if you have never trusted and confessed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, then today it's more important that you give yourself to the Lord than you give money to the Lord. If you've never done that, we would love to tell you more about how you can become a child of God, how you can receive grace and forgiveness and love And all of your sins be covered by the blood of Jesus. There'll be pastors and prayer team members here at the front during this offering time. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we bow before you and recognize that you're the giver of every good and perfect gift. And Lord, we commit ourselves today to give to you in a way that is a sweet aroma, a sacrifice that is pleasing and acceptable to you. Father, teach us to have a heart of generosity, to be givers like you are the great giver. Thank you, God, for what you're doing at Five Stone. Thank you for so many people being committed to our Beyond Initiative. And Lord, we can't wait to see how you prove yourself to be Jehovah Jireh in the days ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name.